Welcome back to a very special Tie and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank. Yeah, we're going to uh, break format a little bit here. We're not going to be talking about any episodes of The Expanse. Uh, but we got something even better than that, because Wes here knows everybody in Hollywood. So tell us what you brought for us, Wes. Show well, us what's in your paper bag. We have a very special guest today. And one of the great things about being able to do this show and have this outlet is we get to bring on people that we love and people that we love to talk to and good pals. And one of my favorite people, somebody that makes me laugh the hardest, is the great, the one and only Ron Perlman. And uh, we're excited to have him on the show. And we're going to talk to him about, I, I'm going to get the, the, my favorite Ron Perlman stories out of him. And then we're going to culminate into uh, this movie that he just did called Nightmare Alley, uh, which is a phenomenal movie. And I never even heard about it until Ron told me. Uh, and you can watch it on YouTube, and there's a great, interesting story behind it. And he was just involved with the remake with his good buddy Guillermo del Toro, uh, and they they're shooting. Uh, they just shot that, and so that will be coming out soon. But without further ado, let's welcome the great one and only Ron Perlman. <laughs> just in time. Just in time. <laughs> Cheers, boys. Happy uh, quarantine. Happy quarantine, Wes. Happy that is, everybody, that does that everybody realize that great. Wes is? West is in the midst of a, a Canadian style quarantine, which is hardcore, man. I'm day 10, I think. But that's the sign of a great actor because he always hits his fucking mark. Hits his mark. He hit his mark, man. Ty was saying that West knows everybody in Hollywood, and this is proof that West even knows the nobodies in Hollywood. <laughs> so um, uh, you know, we, that's versatility, baby. Nobody's been able to say that about you for about 30 years, man. Oh, uh, well. You should be in my house more often. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start off this whole thing with talking about the first time I ever met Ron Perlman. Mm, and wow. uh, I remember showing up. You had your pants down, right? <laughs> no, you had your pants down. And so and I. Were you there that day? I was. That was my first day. That was my very first day. And I, I wasn't shooting that day. But Ron and I were working. No, on but this what day. was on the call sheet? You had to show up for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, that I had uh, some alternative motives, but Ron and I were shooting this uh, pilot called Hand of God. It was on Amazon and I had to come in for a fitting and I had to go down to San Pedro and I had to go down for a fitting, whatever. And I was really excited to meet Ron and meet the cast and, uh, and I had a really great experience with the audition and, and uh, Mark and Mark Forrester, who was the director of the pilot. And so I go, <laughs> I go down there and I'm in fitting. And, uh, you know, we're having a conversation, doing this. I was in the trailer and they go, you know, uh, you should go say hi to Ron. He's shooting right now. And I walk, I walk out and Ron is naked in a fountain chanting to himself. And, uh, and that's the first time, yeah, that's the first time I got to meet old Ronnie Pearl. I got to come up and shake his hand. And uh, I, I thank talk God a little bit about that experience. My, thank God you only shook my hand because, you know, there were a lot of... <laughs> A lot of actors getting their jollies that day, if I recall. I mean, you know, but think about how that must have been because the crowd was gathering around the, the water fountain in that situation. And did you have to be completely nude? I mean, could they put a, you know, a modesty patch on you? Um, yeah. That was, no, in the script, uh, it actually called for him to have clothes on. He just stripped down the, for no reason. That was the first image of the first moment of a series that we hoped would go beyond the pilot. And I said to all the people involved, I said, if you guys want to even get to act two, I wouldn't open this way if I were you. Because <laughs> there are going to be a lot of, you know, I played fucking Hellboy, you know, there's going to be a lot of really disappointed people. You know? <laughs> going to be, you know, you talk about shattering dreams. But, I, um, Ron, I wouldn't say that. I would say that you get a nice piece on you. Oh, you should be proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's Hollywood, to, baby. That's that's how we do it in Hollywood, man. So, cut to I got to work on you know this thing, Hannah God, and I got to meet him, and I liked Ron right away. And uh, and in the and during that time, you were um, you just finished uh, the book that you did um, is the easy road the hard way, and uh, easy street, easy street, easy street the hard way, and uh, and you sent me uh, a. PDF, email, PDF of the book or whatever. And you said, what do you think about it? And I read it. And I, I mean, I was, I just 
I, you know, I, I think your skill as a writer and as a storyteller, and I laughed so hard and it was so honest and all these great stories about, you know, that hopefully we'll get to. I'm going to highlight my favorite ones of your career and the movies that you got to work with and the great people that you got to work with. And I just really enjoyed it. And then we got to go work. Your production company did this movie called All I See Is You with Mark Forster again. It was a band together. And then I got to go to Thailand. And uh, our good buddy, Mike Selby, was a big part of that movie and putting that thing together. Mm. And then that's when I really got to have drinks with you and go to dinners and hang out. And, uh, right. and, and no, you know, I just felt like nobody makes me laugh like you made me laugh. And uh, so, you know, when we were doing this or putting this together, Ty and I both were like, we got to get Ronnie Pearl on the show uh, immediately. Well, thank you, man. I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you guys. Um, and uh, um, I got to go. So <laughs> it was great. Really, really, hey, really that, nice. hey, look, just as long. Hey, just as long as you're here and, and, uh, and being I just want to know, um, um, you did pay retail for the book, right? I mean, it, you know, no, just no, no, sorry, brother. I mean, I know I, I sent you a free copy. You remember so. I sent you, I sent you a picture of the book. Um, I was working somewhere in another country. I can't remember what country it was, but I was working somewhere and there was your book in that country and I sent it to you. And you were like, how the fuck? You said like, you know, what, <laughs> that's not coming back to me. Do you remember that? Was it like, you know, you didn't know that it was in this country or whatever. Do you know what I'm talking about? You remember this I kind of, I kind of vaguely remember. I really remember though, um, um, your reaction to it, you know, mm -hmm. vividly because it, you, you know, the, 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 the greatest feedback that you can ever get is the feedback of the, your peers, of, 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 the, of the people who do, who strive to do the same thing you're doing. And you under, we understand each other in a way that, you know, there's a shorthand. Um, we, we, we've had kind of experiences that are parallel and, you know, we, we understand the road and the game and the whole thing. And so it was, um, it was just beautiful. Uh, the stuff that you said after having read the book about um, the identification that you had with your own personal, like, holy shit, I thought it was just me. And I heard that from a lot of actors. You know, they, I, thought, I thought I was the only one that was going through that shit. I thought, wow. I mean, when you told that story about, you know, and, you know, it, it, I tried to uh, paint as, as vivid a picture as I could about the, the, the the reason why it was called Easy Street is because, you know, you walk through an airport and people know you from a TV show and they assume that you, you're worth three quarters of a billion dollars, you know, and that you, you have five homes and, um, you know, a, a little getaway on the, on the Cote d'Azur, you know what I mean? You know, they really imagine, because you've been in some stuff, that you're on Easy Street. And, uh, but unfortunately you only had two homes at the time <laughs> and I've lost both of them in the, in the pandemic. Um, I, I did not, uh, I did not make the right investments. Is it, is it really hard to leave your Lamborghini in long-term parking when you go to the airport or do you worry about it? <laughs> you know, with, with the insurance policies that I carry now, nah, I don't really worry that much. But I no, do. but um, um, you know, it's it it, it is it's a, it can be a very tough business, um, it can be a very brutal business, uh, and even when you are guys like you and me who have had more than our fair share of of good fortune, you know, there can be these horrific periods, fallow periods through two three years where the phone's not ringing and you're not, and you don't know how you're gonna, you know, um get through the, the the next little bit of time you know so the easy street was a kind of a tongue-in-cheek kind of like uh you think you know me you think you understand what this life is and i'm, I'm, I'm going to try to do my very best to try to show you that you know i'm just as average as <laughs> as anybody you can you can imagine um, well I, I'll, I'll say too i mean this is actually you know related to one of my stories about you um even when it's working well, even when you're successful, people have this idea that acting is a very easy job, but it can, and, and maybe sometimes it is, but it can also be an incredibly demanding job. I remember talking to George when, when you guys were both on Beauty and the Beast, 
talk, he talking to me. He's like, you know, Ron Perlman showed up two hours before everybody else, you know, two hours before call Ron was there. He was spending two and a half hours in a makeup chair every day. That's because he was a lion. That he was, yeah, it was a lion. And then, and then, and then, and then when you'd wrap and everybody else was going home, you were back in the chair for another hour and a half while they took all this stuff off. I mean, well, George, people never see that part of the business though. They never see how, you know, how as, cool. as beloved and as, as prolific and as, and as, as much of a giant as George is, he totally got it fucking wrong. It was four <laughs> hours. Oh yeah, he fucked it up. <laughs> and I'm calling George. In fact, I'm going to get him on the phone right now. Hang on. George needs to get his compliments so. straight. You know, if huh? we're going to do this. George needs to get his compliments straight. If we're going to yeah. do this, but we're going to get to uh, George R. R. Martin. I mean, we, we 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 while we're on the subject, you know, Ty just kind of threw this name out there, but you know, it's the it's the it's the inimitable. Uh, <laughs> giant uh, author george r r martin is responsible, to me. responsible for game of thrones you know if you if you know if, if you just want to do the superficial shit and so much more but his one of his only tv gigs was he was a staff writer on beauty and the beast and this is long before long before we did this in the late 80s so nobody he wasn't george r r martin yet he was just this cute little guy who who you know like uh uh looked like he had come out of uh, the uh, uh, casting call for the movie reds because he always wore that like <laughs> that soviet proletariat kind of cap of his you know seemed very um um pro-labor but anyway i digress uh I well, just look, we'll, that we'll get was a great beauty, inside huh? we'll get to beauty and the beast but one thing you know one thing that i love about being in this business is you get to meet people like you that I get to meet people like Ty. Because when I was growing up, I was obsessed with movies. I was obsessed with stories. My dad was the same way. And what, when I first got introduced to movies is my dad would watch AMC, these classic movies, and we'd watch them over and over and over. And I was just, I, I, they just captivated. They were my friends. They were the people that I connected to. They were the things that I connected to growing up. And so when I was younger, I would always want to just talk to people about these things and like, and go over it. And it, I would wear people out very fast. You know, growing up in North Georgia, there wasn't a, a, a big appetite to talking about the arts. And so I, when I come across somebody like you and like Ty, and where we can talk for hours and we, we, we love things the same way, we under things, understand things the same way. When did that, when was that awakened? In you? When did you, uh, was your, did your dad introduce you to these great movies and this? Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly like you, except, you know, 65 years earlier i mean you know but there was no amc when my dad was there were three networks you know there was cbs nbc and abc and then there were a couple of local things i grew up in lower middle class uh, apartment in new york city uh northernmost part of manhattan called washington heights my dad was a, a laborer he fixed other people's broken televisions um he had been a musician so he had a kind of a a uh, show business kind of uh, aura around him. I mean, if if there was any justice in the universe, he probably would have stuck to music. But because he was raising kids and trying to put food on the table, he realized it was just too heavy a lift and he got out of it. But the culture <clears throat> that he carried with him for the rest of his very short life, he died at 49, was his first and most foremost gift to me. Um, uh, and it included uh, a voracious appreciation of, of really good movies. Back in the early 50s, um, it was, you know, it was real hard to find a bad movie because you've just coming off the greatest period in, in Hollywood history, which is the huge, the, the huge studio period of the 30s and 40s where they were churning out so you and i talked about this yesterday they were churning out um amazing um explorations of of uh the human condition by the greatest people who ever put pen to paper who existed in literature you know the, the studio moguls were uh very eager to compete with one another and by competing well i'm going to get ernest hemingway to write this screenplay, yeah. Well, I'm going to go get William Faulkner, and so, you know, the the uh, 
My dog just showed up. <laughs> no worries. You can't have that. That's an adult drink. Um, so anyway, I'd sit there with my dad and, you know, he, he, he really loved Errol Flynn. He really loved John Wayne. So I was watching all the John Ford movies. I was watching all the Howard Hawks movies. I was watching all the Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy movies. I was watching, you know, the Raoul Walsh movies. I mean, I was getting, I didn't understand the education I was getting. I didn't understand how important these guys were to the language of, of inventing cinema. Because they were, every name that I just named started working in the 20s before sound. And so they were, they were inventing the art form before the art form was truly even formed. And they were very responsible for understanding, you know, going from telling little stories to like, well, what's to prevent us from doing The Tempest? What's to prevent us from making Anna Karenina, you know? So these guys were responsible for this huge sweep in what cinema started off to be, and then having it expand into all of its capabilities. And my dad happened to love that shit. And I happen to love my dad in a way so that whatever he was down with, I was down with, you know, and I would just like, I would, however much time I could spend with him, watching him do what he loved and having it transfer over to me, that was basically my whole childhood. And that's so much, that's how I start the book that you, that you refer to. Yeah. And it's a great the influence that he had on me and how, you know, he turned me on to those guys, to this love for, for cinema. And it wasn't yeah. until later that I understood holy fuck, John Ford wasn't just this guy that made some, you know, cool little westerns with commercials in them. He was a giant who gave us so much of the language that we're all still standing on the shoulders of that. You guys making the expanse, you know, your forebears are these guys. Yeah. Whatever we're doing now, we owe to the stuff that those guys were discovering about what the camera is capable of doing. And when you mix it with amazing thought and image and sound, meaning music, you know, it is this, and then it's, of course, this, as much of a study in, of the human condition as any philosophical, you know, book you're ever going to pick up by Nietzsche or Schopenhauer or anything. So it's everything. Movies are everything to me, and, and they work to my dad, and that's, that's how the whole spark got lit. And I think what hooked me to the book right away is, you know, you starting off with your dad's death. My dad died, you know, uh, a few years earlier before I read that book. And then we had that similar experience where when I was younger, the one thing that me and my dad connected with is on movies. And I felt like when I was younger, it was like the one, well, two things, uh, to, to earn his, the two things that he respected most is the military and movies. And so I thought, you know, later in retrospect, when I look back and I'm like, I, I dedicated my whole life to winning his approval, military, and then getting into movies. And, uh, and we had this many, really- Many of us do. That's yeah. And do. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know that that was like this underlying, like I had this drive and this thing that was motivating me. But looking back, I realized like that was the invisible hand. And it really, the pinnacle of that was I was doing this movie called In the Valley of Ella. And, uh, and um, uh, Paul Haggis directed, it was Susan Sarandon, Charlie Theron. And uh, Clint Eastwood produced it. And when I was younger, me and my dad would watch Clint. I mean, Clint Eastwood was everything. You know, yeah. we loved Clint Eastwood. And the outlaw of Josie Wells and like was on repeat and was one of my favorite movies. So he got to come to that premiere and meet Clint Eastwood and Clint oh, Eastwood yeah. and have a beer. Yeah, I got a picture of me, my dad and Clint Eastwood. And Clint Eastwood was fucking coolest you know you, you in your book you talk about meeting sean connery and you meet your hero and he lives up to everything you want him to be that was the exact i could not have dreamed this in my head and i and i've dreamed you know things like this in my head possibilities but the fact that he you know my dad got to show up come to this premiere and clint eastwood invited me over to have a beer with him and talk about how much he enjoyed the movie and the performance and you know all that and that was that wow. was you know one of the greatest moments of my life it was of the you know, it was the greatest thing but I, what I'm curious about, because I know you went to school in New York for acting, and then you went to Minnesota, you went to University of Minnesota, and, and, and you know, University of Minnesota is like, there's a, you know, they take the art serious. No, I'm serious. They take the no, art No, no, no. I'm laughing because 
What? No, you're painting this phenomenal picture of this, you know. Well, well, yeah, I mean, and then you, I, you, I saw it my my my. Uh, well, you my were running husband. away from parking, you know, and then I I ended up at Oxford, you know, constantly. <laughs> no, I I went to Lehman College in the Bronx because it was free. It was the only fucking university I my parents could afford to send me to. And then you run away from parking tickets. And and the only reason I ever did a, a school play was because they had an audition and uh, I was on the swimming team and and the the swimming coach made me stop doing laps and practice and, and go audition for the school play because 35 girls showed up for the audition and no boys so they you know they they forced me off the swimming team and into the world of drama kicking and screaming because I I much rather had you know remained on the swimming and hang out with 35 girls and then the oh, University man. of Minnesota, which is where this this is why I'm laughing when you were going. And then you're you started your acting. No, no, no. You know, like I fucking man, I backed into everything. Uh, the University of Minnesota, which I I did get a master's degree in theater. The only reason I went there is because while I was in undergraduate school in the Bronx, I had accumulated close to eight thousand dollars in parking tickets. Because you couldn't park in the Bronx. There were no parking spots. I, I double parked for my entire college career. And I ended up with $8,000 in parking tickets, which is like $800,000 now. I didn't have the money. So I went to the University of Minnesota because I saw a brochure for the theater department in Minnesota. And I said, oh, the cops will never look for me there. And that's the only reason <laughs> I have a master's degree. It's well, I was on the LAM. I was on the LAM from the Parking Violations Bureau. And I swear to God, bro, that is the fucking truth. What did you ever pay those tickets? My mother, they found my mother while I was, <laughs> and my mother you said, "Just mother. do it. Don't hurt my Ronnie. Don't hurt her, him. How much does he owe you? Uh, he owes us seven thousand eight hundred and fifty-six dollars. Are you kidding me? How could you get that many parking tickets?" <laughs> <laughs> but she, you know, to save me from uh, uh, from a life of some sort of Charles Dickensian <laughs> fate, she she paid my parking tickets. And but the good news is that um, on March fourteenth of this year, I will finally have paid her back. <laughs> <laughs> she let me pay her on the on the installment plan. So it's been, you know, <laughs> dollar down, dollar a week kind of thing. Right. What a good son. Yeah. What a good mom, huh? Yeah. I'm curious about when did the, okay, so this is interesting, you know, to, to hear this. So when, when, when was All your that, research right out the fucking window. <laughs> He's when, a degenerate. He had parking tickets. That's the only reason he got an education. No, no, no. I mean, you make that clear in the book, that parking tickets were the, re, the reason that you went to Minnesota. But when did you make that transition of like, this is what I want to do for a living? This is what I want to do. I want to, I want to tell stories for a living. This is the thing that I want to be. Well, there was, you know, the actual act of, of going away to Minnesota was not just to um, be on the lam from the Parking Violations Bureau, although that was the main reason for it. But it was also because I noticed that I was falling in love with, with doing plays. I, I did one play after another in high school and then in college. So that's six years by the time I go to the University of Minnesota. I've been kind of um, discovering myself in this world six years worth. And I was feeling this, this unbelievable magnetic pull toward like, uh, but also was, was combining that with the, the fear of how unstable that world is and, and, and how every professional actor I knew was living in a cold water flat, you know, literally without hot water, eating spaghetti two or three times a day and living with, you know, ratty sweaters. And I mean, their lives were horrific, the, the, the life of the young, obscure professional actor. So by going to Minnesota, I was buying myself a bit more time and trying to see how badly I really, really you know, wanted this thing. And by the time I got done with the two years in Minnesota, it was pretty clear that there was nothing I could do in this life that would give me as much joy and satisfaction as acting. And what so, was your, what was your first, I'm um, like paying gig? I mean, when did you, when did you finally land a job and say, Oh, I can actually make 
a living or I can try to make a living doing this. Well, I still I still am not convinced that I can make a living doing it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer. But um, I think my first acting, I, I auditioned for this repertory company um, on 13th Street and 4th Avenue called CSC. And they did classic. They did, you know, alternating rep, which means they were doing five shows simultaneously. They were doing like Edward the Second and Hedda Gabler and, and King Lear and you know and 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 Zoo Story and everything. And then then they would switch it up and do five other shows. And they did it in a rotating rep. And I think I made uh, sixty one dollars a week. So I think that that was probably my first gig where there was a connection between acting and making money because all the time I was doing it in high school, college, and then grad school, it was gratis. It was just community theater or it was college theater or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I just kicked around New York City from 1973 to 1979, just, you know, getting gigs from, they had two publications. One was called Showbiz, and the other was called Backstage. And if you were an actor without an agent, which I was, those were the only ways to find out where there were casting calls going on. And that's, I would go to these open calls, you know, where you didn't need an agent. And sometimes I would book something, you know, and sometimes, most of the time I wouldn't. So I kind of had a little um, um, day job in order to just kind of, you know, keep me in groceries and shit. What time, what was the time period when you went back to New York? after? So, so, so I was born in 1950, so I got back from University of Minnesota in 73, so I'm 23 years old, when I am no longer, you know, um, the, you know, have, have the comfort of, a, of, an, of, a, of, a, of an organization around me mm -hmm. as a blanket, like a university. Now right. I'm on my own. I'm on the streets of New York. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to pay my own rent. I'm going to buy my own groceries in whatever way that was. And I'm going to try to see if I have what it takes to hang in there long enough to, you know, get enough sparks going to create, you know, a little bit of momentum. Because, you know, usually the New York actor by that time, the only way to actually make money was to be on a soap opera or to be in commercials. Uh, if you were doing theater, and it wasn't Broadway, you were probably working for free or something close to free, yeah. which was fine with me. I mean, you know, just the idea that I was plying my craft, just the idea that I was beating out 50 or 60 other guys at auditions and being asked to be in a production, whether it paid or not, that was everything. And so that was my early, you know, my early years in New York City uh, up until 1979 when I got my first movie. You were in, you were in New York in the most exciting time for me of what New York was. I remember when I was growing up, everything that I knew about uh, growing up in North Georgia, everything that I knew about New York is everything that I saw in movies. And I've always been fascinated by New York. But when I think about New York, because of the time period when I watched movies or whatever, I think of the late seventies and eighties, you know? And so when I go to New York, I feel like I'm on a film set because my experience and knowing in New York and, I, and I'm in love with New York because it reminds me of the movies that I love. So what are the movies that come to mind that were, that were made? I mean, Alan Pecula was doing most of his shit. Woody Allen was doing all of his shit. It's, not, it's nowhere near, uh, <laughs> nowhere near that impressive. It was, uh, it was, uh, Tootsie. Uh, it was, uh, author. Remember Arthur? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Sidney Pollack made Tootsie, you know. Yeah, I mean, Sidney Pollack, man. He's one of the best that, that ever came down the pike. Yeah. And, and uh, then, what was the other one? Uh, the uh, uh, author. Remember author? Yeah. <laughs> Living in love in the New York City. Oh, sorry. With Dudley Moore, right? <laughs> With Dudley Moore. Dudley Moore was so great in that. Yeah. Uh, but no, no, I did, I did see, you know, all the, I, I'm, I'm kind of joking. Like, I did see The Taxi Driver and all those you know, all those great movies, but you know, I'm a child of the eighties and like, these are the movies that were on HBO, you know, repeat. And I would watch those over and over. And that was the time that was really exciting for me in New York. And so when you get, when you got back to New York in 79, is that when the quest for fire audition 
happened? No, I got back to New York in 73. My buddy had a, a, a boutique in Greenwich Village that he owned, and he allowed me to work there, which is what put groceries on the table, paid the, the rent. Uh, but he also was very, very kind of um, generous about if I had an audition, he would let me go. And if I actually booked a gig, he would let me really go and do the gig. And then there was a job waiting for me when I got yeah. back. So he, nice. I, had, I had a very, my best friend at the time um, was really kind of my, almost my, my benefactor because he, he, he always had a safe haven for me between gigs, but he always supported whatever was going right for me in those brief periods where things were going right for me in, in my years in New York. So 79 was the year where I met Jean-Jacques Anneau for a little movie called Quest for Fire. And that's when everything kind of uh, took a left turn. And that was the first movie I ever booked. <laughs> and I, li I like your story about meeting him for the first time. <laughs> that he ironed his jeans. He had cre <laughs> creases down his jeans. And you didn't like him right away? He actually had a sweater tied around his neck, you know, like, <laughs> and he had perfect hair. Like and he had he was French and he had he had cheekbones that were actually up here and a square he was the, he was the most handsome impressive looking man and he was French and he was young and he was like and all I thought was and he was making a caveman movie and my whole experience with caveman movies were Victor Mature and Virginia Mayo in one thousand years BC, BC. where yeah. <laughs> wearing a leopard skin thing that goes you know like this and she's wearing false eyelashes and eyeshadow and stuff and, and he's clean shaven yeah he's clean shaven and they're speaking english you know so i thought i was auditioning for that and then i see this fucking french guy who was just piss elegant with the sweater tied around his neck and i said oh jesus he's a, he's some sort of trust fund kid father gave him some money to go make a fucking movie and like I, you know and I treated him like shit through the whole, through the first audition. He brought me back for a second audition. And I just kept treating him like shit. And what I didn't understand was that the French really liked being abused. So he was <laughs> falling in love with me in his own sick, twisted way. He's going, wow, this guy really doesn't give a shit whether I hire him or not. Now, there's something fascinating about that. I didn't know that he had been an Academy Award winner. I I thought this was a trust fund baby who was going who was going to be like a piece of shit caveman movie, and I certainly didn't know that he was going to to try to do an exploration of this moment in time eighty thousand years ago, using you know the greatest minds in the world on the subject, including Desmond Morris, who was the premier anthropologist at the time, and. Anthony Burgess, who had written Clockwork Orange, but his real gig was he was a linguistics professor, professor at Oxford, and he created a language that he thought might have been something that was springing up at the time, at this particular moment in time. And this moment was very specific because it was the moment where we, I mean, we segued from Neanderthal to Cro-Magnon, and then the modern man sprung out of that. So that was the moment that they were trying to pinpoint. And it was going to be this look at prehistoric man in, in incredibly, you know, uh, with it, with so much integrity and so much, you know, um, of the greatest, greatest input you could possibly in pinpointing this particular moment by a guy who had just won the Academy Award for the best foreign language film. And I didn't know any of that, which is why I got the part. I got the part because I didn't give a fuck about getting the part. This is a magical moment because that quest for fire was in a dad, my dad and I's rotation of things that we watched. And we loved, we loved the, like when y'all discovered farting and laughing, you know, by the fire and, and the invention of the missionary position <laughs> when they're in there. Mm. And that movie, like we, we, that was one of the movies that we would watch every time it was on. And we would, I don't, I don't think you ever mentioned that before. That's I, really I, you cool. know what? I didn't connect those dots. And what's funny is, uh, I was doing the unit, uh, the CBS show, the unit, and uh, one of your, I can't remember the name, I can't remember the name, but one of your, there was three of you, and one of your actors was on there, and uh, was was doing a guest star, a reoccurring. Namir, Namir El Khadi, young, kind of. Uh, Not young. Well, how young? 
Well, <laughs> everybody's old to you, bro. Well, you anyway, know, so he, you're he, an he, 80s he, child. He was you know, on the. Uh, I don't understand what that feels like. Although I have a daughter who's an 80s child, so. So, but anyway, he was on the uh, the show, and him and I uh, started getting talking, and he was telling me about the quest for fire, and that was his first job. If that rings a bell, it, there's three of you, and then he was one. Yeah. Third. I don't and remember. I think what. he might have been going by the name Nick when you met him, Nick Nick Nicholas Cotty. But his name is actually Namir El Cotty, and he's he and I came up together in New York in those early '70s years, but we were mm -hmm. both working at La Mama, mm -hmm. and we've gone that far back. You were in La Mama, huh? You were in La Bamba? No, <laughs> not La Bamba. <laughs> I will, although I have, I can, you know. But I, the third audition was the one that fucked me. That's why I didn't end up in La Bamba. <laughs> I loved you they in La went, Bamba. They went with. Uh, no, uh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I like. Ahead, this, I, I like this track we're on. <laughs> um, the three guys were me. Everett McGill, who was the real lead of the movie, and I don't think it was him. And then this third guy was Namir El Khadi. Yeah, I, that that's not. Yeah. And that's I think funny. he was on the unit because he and I are incredibly dear friends and and have basically shared all of the movements of our lives ever since we met, which was back in the mid seventies. And I'm the godfather of, of of his daughter, and so we're really close. And I remember him telling me stories about being on the unit. Dennis Haysbert was on that yeah, show, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I remember him being a part of that. Um, Ty, would you say that the greatest single influence on The Expanse is Ice Pirates? Well, I mean, it's got to be up there. It's, I mean, it's, it, it, like, if we're talking top five, absolutely. I mean, look. You know the Canterbury—they're they're ice haulers. Right, they they ice out, all they ice around. Bring it back. Yeah, they do that. But uh, you know what's interesting about ice pirates, and this is nothing—the you know, the biggest three. <laughs> no, no biggest I mean the, the little the little robot clamps that castrate you—that was pretty interesting. That was yeah. very interesting. Well, listen, we all thought it was really funny at the time, but you know, <laughs> well, I mean, one of the you know biggest thrills, you know, that that I get to have you here and talk about ice pirates because here's the thing. When when I was growing up and th these movies would come on and I would watch them, Ice Pirates, I loved it. And so now as I come into, uh, you know, as you're working and everything like that and you're having a conversation about movies and you bring up Ice Pirates, I was unaware <laughs> of the reputation that it had. Yeah. But what I think is really interesting about Ice Pirates is that it was, a, uh, it was supposed to be a big budget, serious sci-fi movie and ultimately, uh, MGM was going through some hard times at, at that time. And so they slashed the budget and went down from like 20 million to like 8 million. And, uh, and so mm. they decided to turn it into this comedy. Yeah. Um, well, it definitely turned into a comedy. I mean, that's what, we were, that's what we thought we were making at the time. When you were making it, like, what was, what was your, did you enjoy it? Did you, what did you think it was going to be? Did you have a good time with it? I probably thought, um, and still do that it was it was a classic sophomore slump experience mm -hmm. because I had just come off Quest for Fire. Quest for Fire was as trippy an experience as, as, as you could possibly have. And as prestigious as you can get. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was this movie that was done with amazing care and thought and dignity and integrity and not at all with a mind for, you know, how much money it was going to make or whether it was going to be a good thing for the studio or not. But it was, it was, it was meant to be something of great import um, with a, a, a great amount of all the, the best things about why you would make a, a movie or anything that you want to have a kind of a, uh, uh, an important look at a, a certain subject. Um, yeah, Ice Pirates was the opposite, man. Ice <laughs> Pirates was, Ice Pirates was, you know, a vehicle, a vehicle, and it was, it was, and you're right. It was the I did you know more about the circumstances around it that it, at some point had a bigger budget and it was not essentially supposed to be a comedy, which it turned into. But it was the 
the last gasp of the greatest studio, movie studio ever on this earth, which was MGM. And MGM was, you know, like little by little, just <laughs> petering out. Ice Pirates was, was, the, was the final kind of like, it wasn't even a period at the end of a sentence. It was kind of an ellipse, you know, it was like, it, you know, the sentence that never ended. Um, but you know what's great about Ice Pirates? It was a piece of shit. It was yeah. really a piece of shit. But I, I, but it had it had Angelica Houston, who I had a yeah. phenomenal time getting to know, and it had Robert Urich, who uh, had been Dan Tana on on TV in Vegas, and a guy named Michael D. Roberts, and I had a ball making it. Um, and I, you know, we did some really outrageous. Did you know movies. it was a piece of shit when you were making? Oh, I knew it was a piece of shit all along. And I, I don't know. I don't like all this harsh talk about ice pirates i mean this was <laughs> well get over it man we have alcohol I'm, I'm i'm a little older than wes we're pretty close in age um so i remember ice pirates very fondly as well I, I i remember there was a time when i thought that was a pretty good movie angelica houston sexy as hell is like the space you know barbarian queen with leather clothes on being uh, cosby's daughter crosby what's her name uh Sexy Mary Crosby. Well. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, well, uh, Angelica Houston is actually the daughter of John Houston. Yeah. One of the greatest filmmakers. You talked about Maltese Falcon. John yeah. Houston wrote and directed Maltese Falcon. Uh, and and the Bogart Maltese Falcon is my favorite movie of all time. Which which brings us which is full circle. Which is yeah. why, you know, I mean, they were redeeming aspects of hanging out on the set of Ice Pirates, and one of them was, hey, uh, you know. Did your dad ever talk to you about Maltese Falcon? <laughs> you know, just, um, so we got to work with, exactly what I would have asked too. In Thailand, we got to work with uh, uh, John. Uh, what's his son's name? Houston. Um, uh, yeah, phenomenal uh, actor. Danny. Danny. And Danny, you know, is another one that has these great stories and these great stories about his father and the, the history. And um, I you mentioned like, you mentioned Jared. Um, um, Harris, mm. that, that beautiful evening you and I had with him and, uh, you know, having the dinner, dinner we had it. So, yeah. But Danny's like that, you know, I don't know if you recall, but like I asked Jared because I'd not met him until that night, you know, and, but it was a thrill for me to meet him because first of all, I'm a fan of his, but second of all, he's the son of Richard Harris. Yeah. And if you're a, a movie geek like I am, that's, that's a big thing to be. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had heard a lot of folkloric stories about Richard Harris because. Oh, he is a man of folklore for sure. Yeah. He's, he occupies a huge swath in some of the, I mean, his, his on screen persona is, is magnanimous, but his off screen persona is even bigger. Um, the shit that he got into with Oliver Reed and pubs and shit. So, but the great thing was at the early, moments of our little dinner that night i said to jared are you one of these guys that hates talking about your dad or are you one of these guys that likes talking about your dad he said no i love it i love it i can't get enough and i said great because it, i'm going to tell you some of the stories that i heard about your dad and you're gonna if, if it's okay with you you're gonna tell me if they're true or if they're <laughs> folklore or if they're just got things that that you know that like started off like a little fish and then end, ended up like you know 162 pound tuna you know um so that danny houston is like that danny yeah. is is a guy who it really like you, you want to talk about his old man he's game whereas angelica you know she's she's off doing her own thing and you know like oh i love my dad and everything but you know let's let's just talk about it you know she's got the, jack nicholson the here and now you know equation. Um, Ron's referring to, uh, me and Ron and Jared and his wife. We had dinner one night in New York at the Soul House. We had these great stories because Ty and I, uh, last show spent about 45 minutes going through all of Jared Harris's filmography and, uh, and then talking about him and, you know, and the, the, it's rare that somebody, their dad is such a heavyweight talent and the son lives up to the, the amount of talent that his dad has. I mean, he, he, it's absolutely, you know, so like you, I just went through two quarantines. I, I had a two week one 
in Toronto because Toronto demands 14 day quarantine. And then I, I segued onto this other gig in Boston, which was an eight day quarantine. And in those two quarantines, I got to watch the first couple of seasons of The Crown, which is Jared Harris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Chernobyl, which is Jared Harris. We talked about Chernobyl. It's, it's, I think it's the best thing that was made that year. I oh, thought it was an astonishing work. And, you know, he's, he, like you say, Wes, he, he has that command and that presence and that integrity that his dad had um in spades you know he, he's he's a real chip off the old block which is nice to see it's really hard to live up to the old man when the old man occupies a space as big as richard harris you know and jared manages to do that so it, it's tricky it's tricky to go into the same business as your dad in in that way you know you see a lot of actors who their their children try to follow in their footsteps and are not are never quite as successful. They always kind of live in the shadow. So it is, it is impressive. Hey, that, that reminds me of a quick story. Uh, so, you know, obviously I'm I, like, I, I'm a Clint Eastwood nut, uh, you know, and uh, I, I, I was studying with this lady, uh, Nancy Banks in Hollywood. And one day uh, we were doing, we were working on, Oh, also this is a correction from yesterday. Uh, I was working on uh, um the Arthur Miller play, uh, Death of a Salesman. And uh, what I was talking about earlier was the, uh, uh, who was the actor we were talking about yesterday? And I saw, and I saw him, he was, he played Happy. Who was the guy that we, he was in the blind, who's the blind bad guy? What's the guy's name? Malkovich. Uh, no, he, no, Malkovich was the brother. This, Stephen Lang. Stephen, oh, Stephen Lang, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Stephen Lang played Happy or whatever. Anyway, that's, that's a side note. It was Death of a Salesman, uh, and, uh, Stephen Lang played happy and John Malkovich played the other brother anyway. So, Biff. um, so we, uh, we were in this class and, uh, and Scott Eastwood, Clint Eastwood's son was in this class. And I immediately was like, we're, we're fucking friends, bro. <laughs> like, you know, no. And, uh, so we, there was a moment uh, before we were doing our scenes and doing our plays, whatever, where we, where they have us, you know, get on the floor, you know, I, acting, you know, you went to school you know how it is so you get on the floor and you do this meditation before we do it she took us through this meditation and at that moment she said now i want you to visualize your dad in front of you and i couldn't do the exercise because the whole time i'm like this motherfucker is a magic clean that's his fucking dad i can't believe that so it completely took me out of the the whole thing uh that uh that That's but he great. was a great guy and he was re you know really talented he's gonna have a big career he's gonna be you know he's yeah i've seen him in some stuff he's got he's got a really beautiful presence yeah he's a you know he's a, he's a handsome dude so you did quest for fire when did uh name of the rose have did he you know just call you up and say hey i want you to do this thing for name of the rose it was um the opposite um you called him up? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, man, it's been a while. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I groveled. I uh, groveled. Uh, no. No, you know, uh, Quest of Fire was um, this really, um, looking back on it, you know, it, 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 it was one of those things that, you know, you look back on in real, with real perspective and go, what an amazingly important, uh, dignified thing to have been involved in, but it led to nothing. You know, it led to nothing. And um, because it was such a specific kind of a performance with, you know, with me completely covered in some uh, special effect makeup artist vision of this character with absolutely no language that, you know, it wasn't as if, you know, the, the Mary for news of this world, you know, the great casting directors are going to go, Oh yeah, let's put Ron in this, you know, like, no, there was no signal as to what I would be doing next. And there was no next. So I was just, uh, uh, it was one of those, you know, terrifying periods where months and months and months were going by and I had already had my first kid. And, you know, money was running low and stuff. And I, there was no money on Quest for Fire anyway, so there was not a lot of savings. And I read 
um, a little article, I guess, in Hollywood Reporter that Jean-Jacques Arnaud, the guy who directed um, Questifier, was, was going to be doing Name of the Rose. And I immediately went out and bought a copy of the book. And after a couple of attempts, I finally got through the book. It's a very hard book to read because it's really demanding and I'm dyslexic. It's very I'm, dense. Yeah, it's very dense and I'm, I'm dyslexic and I'm not really good at forcing my way through a 400 and some odd page novel. But I did it. And I saw this character, this hunchback character called Salvatore, and I sent uh, Jean-Jacques a, a note saying, if you were to consider me for the role of the hunchback, you would be helping me um, kind of uh, revisit the, the acting exercise that you allowed me to have in Name of the Rose, where I would be playing something that never existed in, in nature. It was something that was more of a, an invention that sprung from an imagination, which is how Umberto Eco wrote him. But it would be the greatest gift you could bestow upon me. And he, he wrote me back and said, well, I'm stuck. It's a multi-national um, production. There's German money in here. There's American money in here. There's Italian money in here. At the end of the day, I didn't have any Italian actors in the Italian government has forced me to cast this Italian co comedian to play the role of Salvatore, but so I'm sorry. And then um, I get a call at 5.30 in the morning one day. I'm sleeping in the living room. My wife was in the bedroom because we'd had a fight and she threw me out. <laughs> and uh, the phone rings at 5.30 in the morning and you could tell it's a long distance call. And somebody on the other end of the phone says, I'm looking for Ron Perlman. <laughs> I'm going, yeah, right, right, yeah, sure, right. No, really, uh, this is very important. I'm standing here with, uh, with Jean-Jacques Arnaud. Uh, is this Ron Perlman, or can you tell me where Ron Perlman is? And I said, yeah, what's going on? And they said, well, before I hand the phone over to Jean-Jacques, I need to know, can you get on an airplane this morning at 11.15 to come to Rome to play Salvatore in the name of the Rose? And I hung up. Because <laughs> I thought it was some fucking practical joke. And sure enough, the phone rings again. I said, no, this is Anna Gross, and I'm, I, I work for New Constantine Films, and this is not a joke, and we're in a really bad situation here. And I'm standing next to Jean-Jacques Arnaud, and he's asking me to give you a call, and he's hoping that you can get on a plane this morning. And I got on the plane and, and ended up as the... The second choice, but the guy who ended up with the role of Salvatore in Name of the Rose. So wow, that, wow. That, was the, that was the genesis of that. And I, I mean, <laughs> how? I mean, if that was a practical joke, that's a very specific, detailed practical joke that had history <laughs> about that you read this book and you did this thing. It's a very. But I was, I mean, thing. after being thrown out of bed by your wife. Right. I was really ready to be set up for the ultimate. Like somebody's going to do some research and really fuck with me right now because it's not bad enough that you know I just got thrown out by my old, old lady. But you know somebody's really going to like stick the knife in and twist it around a little bit and really fuck with me, which is like dangling the thing I want most in the world, which which is to play Salvatore in the name of the Rose for my dear friend Jean Jacques Arnaud. And little little little. little Little, you know, little known to me, that's what was going down. What was the, uh, the you know, the reason I'm bringing this up is what was the Sean Connery experience like? It was daunting initially because um, if you remember in the book, and I'm writing a second book right now, and I'm still grappling with how much trouble I have when I get around movie stars. You know, I, I particularly have a problem with getting around my heroes mm -hmm. and then having to do what I'm hired to do, which is to just give a performance and which requires me to just think of myself as their equal. But I can't, I can't do it. I have a hard time doing it. And that's what I was looking at when I was getting ready to work with, with Sean, you know, he had already been, he had already occupied this space in my consciousness. You know, I had, I had known every facet of his career, you know, like not just the James Bond stuff, but 
his forays into re really more nuanced and serious stuff, like the work he did with John Huston on The Man Who Would Be King, and you know, mm. these other attempts he made at these really serious films that he was trying to do. Because Sean w wanted to be regarded as as a journeyman actor. He didn't, you know, he thought that the James Bond imprimatur was limiting to what to how he saw himself as an artist. So being in the name of Rose for him was almost as if, hey, I'm still auditioning here to be regarded as something other than just this one dimensional, you know, fucking, you know, 007 dude. It's fascinating to me. Like the, you know, you think about Sean Connery, the, the insecurity of an actor just is never over. It's not, you know, you achieve the Sean Connery status and you're still like pursuing or going for something. But this reminds me of this really great story. I did this movie called The Philly Kid, and Jason Connery, Sean Connery's son, directed it. And uh, I had this really uh, great friendship and relationship with Jason Connery, and he told me this story, one of my favorite stories about Sean Connery. And so Sean Connery had an early misfire in Hollywood, and I hope I'm telling this story right. But what Jason said was, even before the James Bond there was a moment where uh, Sean Connery almost got a contract with Disney, almost got a contract with the Disney studios doing these Disney movies and certain things like that. And so Disney and all the executives, they invited him out uh, to New York and they went to go see a play. And then after the play, they were going to have like dinners and drinks and stuff. So Sean went there and they gave him two tickets. And so he went to, he uh, invited one of his friends to come watch the show with him. His friend never showed up. So he was standing outside the box office the friend never showed up. And then he just goes, hey, does anybody want a ticket? Because there's people around that are trying to go, does anybody want a ticket? So somebody grabbed his ticket. He sat down uh, in the theater and they start to play. <laughs> and the guy that took the ticket sits down next to him and he has, a, he has a drink and he has a straw and it's this you know, flamboyant gentleman. And he sits down and he goes, oh my God, you're Sean Canary. Like that. And so, <laughs> so he goes, yeah. So they ended up having this great conversation. Everything was good. The, the, you know, and they sit through the play. The play's over. Uh, no, no, no. It was uh, the intermission. And so in the intermission, he's, you know, he goes out and he starts talking to the Disney execs. And there's like four guys there and everything. This was a time when that, you know, flamboyant scene did not go in the mainstream. And so he's having a conversation and his buddy that he just met that was sitting next to him came up and he, he just got his fresh drink and he had a straw. And he goes, Sean, are you going to introduce me to your friends? And so he said, <laughs> Uh, and he said at that point, you know, and he goes, oh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, so-and-so and, you know, and, you know, and they, they, they killed his contract for Disney. So, he, like, you know, what, whatever the vibe wasn't the right thing or whatever. And so he ended up not going through and having that career. And he went back. And then not long after that, James Bond came along. And that's how and that's when he became James Bond. But he almost had a Disney contract doing these Disney movies like like a Kurt Russell or something like that. Yeah, like Fred McMurray. I, you know. Yeah, Fred McMurray. I really want to believe that he stayed in touch with that guy. <laughs> like they just stayed friends. Like they stayed friends for life. I really want to believe that. And Jason thing. said the guy called him uh, Canary, Sean Canary, the whole time. He goes, "Oh my God, you're Sean Canary." <laughs> like, no. Are you still in touch with Jason? Uh, no, I mean, I, I I haven't talked to him in a few years, but I could probably. I, I, I did a movie he directed too. You know. Oh, so. what movie was that? Oh shit! It was uh, can't remember the name of it, but it was. I uh, I really liked Jay. Did you have a good experience with him? I love him. Yeah. But the movie he was asking me to be in was like uh, a, a couple of rungs under Ice Pirates in my <laughs> in, in my in my esteem. And, well, you, you know, know the kid was the esteem uh, column of my uh, my. Um, sorry, Ty. I shoot from the hip. I you know I I I, I say. I say everything that's on my mind. I'm really hurt that you're bashing Ice Pirates right now. And I think Wes is too. Yeah, but, I mean, look, look, you know, I have right. had long conversations about Ice I have the right to bash. If anybody has the right to let bash Ice you, Pirates. Let me tell you what's interesting about Ice Pirates. Because you had Star oh, Wars. please do. Okay, <laughs> listen, this is, this is, he, it has a moment in history because you have you know, I've already mentioned Angelica Houston in the leather cat suit, right? So that's already been mentioned. And that's a highlight. And so, but you have Star Wars, right? And then you have all these other space, you know, draw, like these serious space movies that are coming out at that time. There's like this flood of these things in which Ty and I loved them all. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you got Outlander, you got the, the Sean Connery Outlander, you got all these things. 
uh, all these movies. And then as it's starting to get saturated, the market's getting saturated. And it was like the first year that the Star Wars movie, uh, Star Wars, uh, like Return after Return of the Jedi was the first year that the Star Wars toys started to diminish in sales. And so they realized that this, you know, this capitalizing on the Star Wars momentum and, and then at the same time, MB, MGM had this hit and they had to downsize this thing. So Ice Pirates was really one of the last space movies of that period. And they turned it into a comedy. The very last one was The Last Starfighter. That was the very last star. That was a really, that was the very last studio adventure space movie until they revived it later on. But at that time, you know, Space Pirates was one of the last space movies that was like the space adventure fantasy. I wish and, it had ended one movie earlier, but uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't even think they finished. Like if you watch The Last Starfighter now, which is a, which is a beloved movie in my group, but if you go back and watch it, I don't even think they finished. It's still the computer, like the, the, the visual effects of the ship coming down and landing at the end. It's, mm. it's the actual basic like computer like skeleton of the visual effects that like is, is what you see when they show you like a prelim of a, a when you're watching a pre-cut of a movie or something before they actually fill it in with visual effects. I mean, it, it, to be fair to it, at the time, that was pretty much the limit of what the effects could do. You know, I mean, they were... No, I mean, Star Wars was above and beyond. Yeah, that. but Star Wars, Star Wars was practical models. It wasn't CGI. So this was a, this was like early CGI. I thought the it first was, CGI it was, this was the first it, movie. Last, no, Last Starfighter was the first movie to use all CGI effects for the ships and space scenes. It was the first movie to do that, um, and it was very primitive. It was very primitive effects. So the stuff you were seeing was kind of the limit of what the the computers could do at the time. I'm watching. I'm like, they didn't even finish this fucking movie, but I love it. It's fucking great. <laughs> you could probably for like a million bucks. You could probably get Last Starfighter and do re-renders of all of those visual effects and completely improve them. Hi, that's a great <laughs> fucking idea. That is a I'm great sure idea. Like, already thought of it. I'm sure remaster, remaster the Last Starfighter, get a, get as much support. You know the nostalgia factor of that because guess who would be first in line in the theater to go see that? But to go do it and redo the visual effects and the. Oh, and, and do that. That's a that's a phenomenal idea. I'm gonna claim it as my own and see if I can get it going. But now we're at the part of the journey where we're gonna uh, enter Guillermo del Toro, and you went to Mexico City to do Kronos. Right. Oh my God, Kronos! Kronos, man! What a great movie! What a great fucking movie! How did that even? How did they? How did he find you? How did you get? You know? How did you? In, how did that become a part of your journey? Um, in that the, it's so it's so interesting because you know now that you've seen the majority of Guillermo del Toro's body of work, you realize that he's obsessed with with creatures and things that don't exist in nature that spring out of you know his very very gothic imagination, and he was he's he's always been obsessed with with that exploration. But in Mexico, when he was a kid, who, and he was, you know, like a lot of what we're talking about here, dreaming of a life in the cinema, mm -hmm. he was um, coming up with all of these inventions in his mind, but there was nobody down there to execute these, these, these creatures, nobody to create them for him to put on film. And so he came to Hollywood and started studying with Rick Baker and Dick Smith and all and Stan Winston and all the great oh, yeah. um, How did he um, get in special door? effects makeup artists to in order for him to go back down there and, and service his own imagination and build his own stuff so that he could put them on film and, you know, ex and, and, and execute the stuff that was floating around in his imagination. And in so doing, I had already amassed such a body of work in prosthetic makeup. I had already done, at that time, Quest of Fire, Name of the Rose, and Beauty and the Beast. Um, one of those was Rick Baker. Beauty and the Beast was Rick Baker. Um, Name of the Rose was um, Manlio Rochetti, who had been an Academy Award-winning makeup artist. 
and um, Chris Tucker had done Quest of Fire. So I had worked with legendary special effects makeup artists. Rick and Baker. while Guillermo was educating himself, invariably he kept coming back to seeing me on screen. And when he got ready to do Kronos, he sent me a note inviting me to play this role in the movie. More, I think, I think uh, my version of what was behind the note was that he, he, he knew my work almost like uh, this recurring theme of this passion that he had of, of otherworldly um, uh, inventions and wanted me as a part of his first film, almost like a talisman, you know, like a good luck charm, like a rabbit's foot. And I get this beautiful letter from him and, you know, accompanied by the script to Kronos, which was as unique a, a look at vampirism without ever really seeing like a real vampire movie because it was so obtuse and so not on the nose, so, so gothic, you know, so classical. Um, that I looked at it and I went, my God, I have to at least meet the guy who's behind this, n number one, for even noticing me. Because I, I was at the point in my career where I, I didn't think anybody was noticing me. And this note that he sent me was like almost like an homage to like, I've seen you do this, and I saw you do, you know. And I, I had to meet him. And I had to, you know, figure out who this was that was inviting me into this very kind of special little thing. And I, we, 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 we met at a, a, what was the restaurant? Some restaurant on Wilson Boulevard. Uh, is it Chinese food? But it was a couple of fat guys dining together, you know. And He was in you LA know, at the time? Five, yeah, he came up to LA to, to, you know, meet me and to do other things that he needed to do. And uh, we had dinner. And... 10 minutes into the dinner, it was as if him and me had known each other for 30 years. And it was like, we were a couple of bros, you know, like, they were like, of course, I'm going to come do your movie. You know, I have no idea why you're asking me or what you're asking me to do, but I'm coming <laughs> just because you're asking me. And that was the beginning of me and Guillermo. See, I, the thing I love about that is, is what a life changing letter. Wow. Like you get a letter in the mail, you have no idea what it means, what the import of it is. And now you are looking back, you know, 30 some years and, and what a great collaboration that has, what a fruitful collaboration that has been for, oh my for God. decades now, for decades. And it's, and it's, 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 it's actually, I, you know, based on what we're doing now, which is that we just wrapped uh, um, Nightmare Alley and we're still in the midst of doing Pinocchio, his, his Pinocchio. It looks like there's no sign of it slowing down. You know, yeah. it's like God only knows what is to come, but it has yielded um, far and away without hyperbole, without, you know, being overly dramatic. The most life altering experiences that I can lay claim to because, you know, there was. There was Ron free Hellboy, and then there was Ron post Hellboy, and it's two different guys, and it's two different ways of being regarded in the business. That's all Guillermo. That's all, you know. And he is, um, he's one of these guys that when he comes up with a role for me to play, it's not random, it's not a favor. It's like, oh my God, this guy is me. This guy is fucking me. I mean, this, but it's a part of me that only Guillermo is sensitive to. So he's giving me these gifts as an actor that enable me to, to bring certain characteristics out in myself that no other director would give me, that no other filmmaker could give me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a combination of intuition and this feel that he has for the ability to observe humanity and this kind of alter ego thing uh, that he and I share, where it's like we really are, we really are opposite ends of the same coin. If I was a filmmaker, I'd be him. If he was an actor, he'd be me. You know, and so I, I complete his kind of like, 
I, I always think that the roles I play in Guillermo's movies are the roles he'd like to play himself. Yeah, the ones he wrote for himself. Yeah. If, if he if he could act, he would. If he was Quentin Tarantino, he would give himself those fucking roles. But he doesn't. He's not that presumptuous, and you know, he's he's certainly not that pretentious. Um, sorry, Quentin, but you know, <laughs> let's face it. Right before um, we right before we jump in to Hellboy, this it's this is really a magical moment because. You know, we've been friends for a few years now. We've had these great conversations, long things, but the, I'm connecting to things that I don't like me and my dad watching Quest for Fire. But one of the things like uh, last night, our show, we, we had a, I had a long segue into Magna P.I. and about my mother and my mother loved Magna P.I. And that's how I fell in love with Magna P.I. But what's really interesting is having this conversation. By the way, I didn't know that Rick Baker was the makeup guy on uh, Beauty and the Beast, but you know, this is a really special moment because I remember when, you know, another way that me and my mother connected is like, man, we would watch shows, you know, we watch shows. I think uh, Beauty and the Beast was like a, I think it was Friday nights. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we would, you know, we would watch Beauty and the Beast. And what was interesting is because we talked about Man and P.I. because my mom had a crush on Tom Selleck. But she also had the hots for Beauty and the Beast. Oh yeah, and 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 uh, and we would watch the show. I remember watching the show, and my mom and my sister, my older sister, would be like, "Kiss, kiss!" Like they wanted you guys to kiss for like the first two seasons, and they had yeah. the hots for Beauty and the Beast. And you think about the talent of Rick Baker, but also the talent of the performance that you're portraying, the masculinity that comes through the makeup, the connection, and the relationship that you have with Linda Hamilton that makes every woman in America or whoever's watching the show fall in love with you. And th- you know, that's storytelling that's talent because you're a fucking animal. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and George talking about, uh, and let me, let me mention another George story. George talking about beauty and the beast talked about the, the giant mail bags of fan mail that would show up to the network for Ron. And, and George told me, he's like, he, you know, when Ron, took the job and here I'm talking about you guys if you're not here but he said he told me he said when Ron took the job I don't think he ever expected to become a sex symbol and after two seasons of that show he was a he was like one of the hot like you know the you know 100 hottest men kind of thing he was on the list now that's how good Rick Baker is (laughs) is to you know this is this is what he started out with (laughs) you know not a whole lot of guys can can but that, but, that, I mean, that, that has to be that has to be so weird. Like, you know, you're playing this like like Wes was saying this like fantasy character, this Lion Man character, and suddenly you're one you're one of the hottest sex symbols in America. Like, well, it just has to be mind breaking. It was it was it was heady. It was heady stuff. And what was that um, experience like? Because that 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 show was a hit back when there wasn't a lot of hits. There's like three major networks. Prime time was it? What was that experience like for you? Yeah, I don't even know if cable was a thing yet, or if it was. It was such in the infancy of it. HBO it was, was just HBO was just yeah. Getting- HBO maybe you know, but other than that, you know, everybody, you know, you remember this tie, but when HBO started out, that everybody thought that was going to be it. It's a one-off thing. It's not yeah. going to lead to a movement. So certainly, what we have. At our disposal now, which is like you know 978 channels, you know, yeah, all doing uh, original content. But um, I forgot the question. But it, <laughs> <laughs> I was asking what that was like. That experience. Oh my god! I mean, you know, um, it was, it was, it was one of the few, but certainly the first of its kind um, experience in the mainstream because it was cbs which was the tiffany network at the time still known as the tiffany network at the time the network of walter cronkite you know like you know which is how it got that name but associations like that eight o'clock friday nights prime time baby and there we were and not only that but it was um it you know so it had all the trappings of being as mainstream as it gets. And there was, you know, even with the two things that, that had happened to me prior to that, you know, which were both kind of potentially large feature films, Quest for Fire and Name of the Rose, 
they both, you know, net net ended up more cult films than they were blockbusters. I mean, the people who saw them and loved them really saw them and loved them, but they didn't, they didn't, they weren't, you know, going to tip the, the, the needle in any way about, you know, like they weren't going to, they, they weren't going to move the world like, like a Star Wars does. So Beauty and the Beast was like something that I never thought I would, you know, those were plates I never thought I would eat off of, which is mainstream CBS, Tiffany Network, you know. And you had a major uh, prime time. And Linda, Ham- Linda Hamilton, this is after Terminator. You know, and, and it yielded me uh, a couple of Emmy nominations, a Golden Globe win, a number of other things, you know. It yielded me uh, Us Magazine, 20 Most Sexy Men in right? the World. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's like, it was trippy shit, you know, for, for a guy who couldn't square any of that stuff up and still can't. But, but yet it's happening. So you're, you're dealing with stuff, you know, that you, you, you don't quite understand or are willing to accept. So it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're dealing with it on a very kind of, uh, I'm, I'm quite amused here. And I don't know how long this shit's going to last. I don't think it's going to last much, you know, a, a, a really long time. But I'm going to enjoy the fuck out of it yeah. to the degree that I can, as long as I can. So that's what that was. Now we're at one of Ty and I's favorites and another connection. Not back to Ice Pirates. We're back to Ice Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> I say, did I say Ice Pirates? Uh, no, Hellboy. And, yeah. uh, and I love the story of Hellboy. I love the story that Guillermo, Guillermo knew that you were, and you are, the best choice for Hellboy. And he fought for you for, what, like seven years, six, seven years? Uh, seven years. He had other opportunities to make that movie, but he knew that you were the right one for the role. And then he stuck with you, and and they ended up making it. And that's you know that that's that's Hellboy. I mean, that's that's what it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I imagine that that what you just described might have happened to somebody else along the way, but I don't know anybody who had a director who had a hundred opportunities to make the film and said, "Nah, you know, I'm good," until somebody finally you know, agreed with them, like, okay, we'll do it your way. But it took seven years. And five of those years, he was at Universal with, with a contract to make the movie, and he could have made it. He literally could have made it 75 different times if he had just said yes to The Rock or Nick Cage or Steve Austin or whoever was Flavor of the Week that week. Right. And he kept going, um, yeah, no, I love those guys, but you know, I'm not going to do it until I can do it the way I want to do it. That's, we've all been in the business long enough to know that shit does not happen. You, you know? know how many times in, in, in the business where somebody would be like, you know what, this is what we want. You know, you're the great for you went through with it. But as soon as the studio gives a name, they're like, I'm sorry, buddy. You know, we wouldn't do it. Like, like if Ty had a script and he thought I was perfect for it, He's selling me out the first, the first second that somebody else. And, 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 and you wouldn't be surprised, and you wouldn't, and you wouldn't be mad at Ty because that's no, just no, the way you, shit goes. You understand that's the business. You understand like, if I can get the Rock, I'm going with the Rock. Sorry. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> like, like what's his that's name? Bullshit. Like, like yeah, you would pick me. Like uh, what's his name says in the Godfather Part Two? That is the business we are in. Yeah. You know. We, I, I, and I kept saying to Guillermo, literally the whole seven years, I said, bro, the fact that you're, that you're even thinking how you're thinking is so moving for me and so life affirming for me. I'm, fuck, I, I, I'll, I will love you forever, but don't stick to this. You're not going to get your movie made. Move the fuck on. Make it with whoever you can get it made with. I know how important it is for you to make this money. That was me talking to him, and I was sincere. I wasn't saying this for a fact. I wasn't saying this to make him feel good. I was saying this because I didn't want to be the thing that prevented him from doing something he wanted to do as badly as he wanted to do Hellboy. Uh, you know, yeah, but I- he had he had this other thing going 
just faith that um, yeah. I've never seen before and I've never seen since. And he was right because he got it made the way he wanted to get it made. And it turned out to be um, just, you don't get gifts like that, you know, dropped in your lap in this life. You know? That's one of the things unless, unless, unless you're in a very kind of rarefied, you know, place where you know you can't really compare yourself to anybody else and that that's what this experience was like this was this was a one-off this was very very unique and and a complete game changer for me as an actor my trajectory of my career but also for me as you know somebody who's trying to make a living as an actor and and you know it, the things that it led to it finally finally there was a job that i did that led to other work. And that was the one difference between that job and every other job that I had had prior to that. Because the one thing I didn't mention is after Beauty and the Beast, my phone didn't ring for three years. The first call I got after three years was not a call at all. It was a letter from Guillermo del Toro about Kronos. I mean, I was on the balls of my ass. I was flat broke, looking to sell my house. I, you know, I nothing was happening as a result of being on this wonderful show for three, for two and a half seasons. You know, and that's the that was the pattern of my life until Guillermo gives me Hellboy, and then suddenly there's momentum, and there's a continuum, and it's lasted me till to this day. And what did that feel like when you got the final call? that you were going to be Hellboy in the studio movie. What was that like? It was, it was dreamlike, man. You know, without, I mean, it was, it was, it was dreamlike. It was the stuff you see that, you know, that, that ends the best movie you've ever seen. It's like, holy shit, that's a beautiful ending right there. I know what he had been through and I know what he was up against. And I know the stakes of, you know, why, it was such a heavy lift. I know all of that. So for him to have pulled it off was like, fuck. And I've said this to Guillermo. I said, you know, there's, there's literally a guy like me, his first instinct is, how do I ever pay you back? You know, and the, the only thing you can ever, you can't. You can't. You can't pay him back. Which is, I'm a guy who likes to, you know, make sure my, my bill is, you know, covered, you know. I don't like to owe anybody anything. But I can't, I can never pay him back. The only thing I could do is to try to validate his faith in me by, you know, being a good hell boy. So whether, whether that happened or not, I don't know. But um, it was, it was, it was, it was epic. You know, it was an epic effort on his part and equal, equally effort gift. As, as much as, as, as I ever received. I, I, I gotta say, one of the things I respect most about Guillermo, and, and it ties into this story, is he never seems to make the movie unless it's the movie he wants to make. Uh, and, and hearing you talk about him holding out for seven years with Hellboy, you know, one of the things that I've, I've been impatient for is he's had um, uh, In the Mountains of Madness, the H.P. Lovecraft thing, he's had that for, for like a decade, and every time he tries to make it, something comes up that's going to keep it from being the vision he has for that film, and he just won't make it. He just won't. Um, and so the fact that for seven years, they kept saying, you can make the movie, but it won't be quite what you want to make, and he just refused to do it, that sounds like him to me. Uh, like he, I think he's done that at every step in his career. He makes the movie he wants to make, and his vision of Hellboy was you, and he just wasn't going to make it otherwise. That, and 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 – Time has proven him right. Um, the, those, those movies are classics. And, and at the end of the day, yeah. he was loyal to you, but he was, more importantly, he was loyal to the movie. And your presence, sense of humor, your voice, yeah. everything, that's Hellboy. And he that is an artist with integrity and that's standing through it because how many times would that movie been made with Nicolas Cage or whoever at the time? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the fact that he stayed true and created this thing that, you know, people like Ty and I that just absolutely adore and, and worship. And 
And at the end of the day, it would not have been the same experience. You know, that's why th there's moments like that that are so rare. You know, there's moments that, that that come up that are so rare. And then this, 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 uh, this knocked off this, this phenomenal, well, Kronos did, but this is the, in, in this phenomenal relationship and creative artistic expression that you have as friends and that, that keeps going. And it, that brings us to Nightmare Alley. And, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, you and I were having a conversation one night here in Toronto. Uh, you were actually here shooting uh, Nightmare Alley and we had this long conversation. You were telling me about it and it was so weird to me that it was a movie that not only have I now never seen, but I never even heard of. I didn't hear the story of it, and and we'll get into it now. Um, and then you, you told me about it. I came. I went home that night. We we had a late night. I got home at like two thirty three in the morning. And I was like, I'll just put it on for a little bit. But before I did that, I researched. I kind of went online. And I read about it, and the reviews. If you go back to when it came out, the reviews were not great towards it. And I was like, oh. You know, I don't know if I want to sit through something, but I put it on YouTube and I was going to watch it for like five or 10 minutes. I ended up watching the whole thing and I thought it was, uh, and I just thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. I thought uh, everything was firing on all cylinders. It, 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 you know, it was a noir, but it also reminded me, and the thing that I love most and the show knows is I love Twilight Zones and it had like that Twilight Zone message and ending at the end. And, uh, and, you know, like I love noir and I love noir in this period. And even one of the producers of this, of time, that guy, uh, Clint trucks, we went, we, we went to the, uh, we went to this, the Academy's theater and they did like three months of all these old thirties, forties, fifties, noirs that you go and watch and you watch in a the theater and they have these, you know, and they, there's, if there's actors that are still alive that are involved in the movie, they interview them and you do this thing. So it's very special to me. It's a very special period, but this is. A cut above. I mean, I feel like I saw some things in this movie, which is really interesting to me that was so far ahead of his time. Um, and there's some cinematography stuff in there that was so far ahead of his time and the way that it was shot and the way that it was done. Uh, and I don't know much about the, the lead. I don't think I've seen him uh, in, in much other things. And I thought he was phenomenal in this. And I just, you know, and it's got this really great story that I want you to tell us about. Tyrone Powers, right? Tyrone yeah. Power. Tyrone He's Powell. been in a ton of stuff. What are you talking about, man? He was I know. I, I didn't. I didn't know. Like, yeah. No, I didn't see any of the stuff. I mean, he was a swashbuckling guy, right? Yeah. Like, it, yeah. yeah. Like stuff like that. Well, he he was uh, he was definitely one of the handsomest, most clean cut actors under 20th Century Fox contract at the time. Um, one of the things, one of his big claim to fame was he was the original Zorro in a movie called The Mark of Zorro, which he put such a his own stink on that, you know, it became an instant classic and then Zorro became a thing that got revisited, you know, 50 or 60 more times after that. But Tyrone Power was uh, very, very handsome, very, very clean cut guy who had a multi-picture deal with 20th Century Fox. He was one of their most uh, coveted um, members of the stable. But what, you know, what was beautiful about him was that he was, you know, he had a really esoteric, dark side of him that got attracted to worlds and materials that were very unlike what the studio was exploiting from him, which is this clean cut. You know, and he, he read this William Grisham novel, Nightmare Alley, and completely went head over heels in love with it and begged the studio to make it. They did not want to make it because it went so much against his persona that they were trying to cut, you know, to, to, uh, uh, you know, build and, 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 and exploit. Okay. And he made a deal with him and said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put two or three extra pictures onto my contract if you'll just give me the budget to make this. So they gave him, you know, some money, not nearly enough, which is why it's a rather imperfect version of a very big story, I think. Um, you know, but it's, it's so theatrical and so um, cinematic and so dark and weird, but epic in its scope of like the examination of a man 
who flies too close to the sun because he's overly ambitious. His, his ambition has him almost like a drug, you know, has him by the balls. Yeah. Way ahead of its time. Um, but it, in my mind, never got the production it deserved because it was, it was such an amazing in intersection of all these things. And uh, I had a conversation with Guillermo about Nightmare Alley 20 years ago. He hadn't seen the movie, and we watched it together. And I had an instinct that he would see this world and all of the stuff that he was exploring in, in his own filmmaking would immediately you know, um, overwhelm him in a need for, and he had he had he had the exact reaction to it that I thought he would have. Um, but the other thing that I that I that I felt is that because Guillermo has this unbelievable ability to get the resources that make the project the scope that it needs to be that he would finally make the Nightmare Alley of its original potential. And I think the movie we just worked on answers all of that. Well, I hope it does anyway. It has a cast that is as distinguished as any group of actors I've ever worked with before. It's Bradley Cooper and Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara and Willem Dafoe and David Strathairn and Richard Jenkins. And oh, you worked with David Strathairn on that? Yeah. And... Um, Tony Collette, and um, it's just no, it. remarkable cast and a remarkable you know, company. Can I ask which part you're playing? I, I've seen I've seen the original twice. The strong Bruno, man. The, the strong oh, you're man. The man. Oh, okay. How did you see it for the first time? I just, you know, it was one of those movies that they showed at two o'clock in the morning, you know, um, on off channels and stuff, you know. Because didn't he own the film? It wasn't the Tyrone story. Power owned all of the movies he made. He had a very unique, way ahead of his time, uh, contractual relationship with the studio where he owned all of his movies, particularly uh, Nightmare Alley. And he, he put a clause in all of his contracts saying no remakes and no duplications. Now, when he was making movies, there was there was no such thing as the ability to duplicate a movie. There was no videotape yet. You know, it's the 40s. There certainly was no DVD. There was no, you know, no ancillary ability for a movie to be distributed in a different format. But he had the vision in order to say, if, in case there ever is uh, the technology that will make a movie duplicatable, I am forbidding that for this. So you couldn't find a copy of Nightmare Alley. The only way you could see it is if it was somebody was playing it at two o'clock in the morning on some, you know, like weird esoteric channel somewhere. And that's how I originally saw it. But it made such an impression on me that that I I tried to tell everybody that loved movies that I knew, like, fuck, you gotta watch this movie. This this movie haunts my dreams. You know, it it it, it is hauntingly brilliantly cinematic and it's black and white and it's like you know if you're a film geek this is an important film to watch and how did you show it to guillermo did you get a copy or a print or so there was this <laughs> back in the <sighs> what, what what year was it, it was he and i worked together in 91 it was, it, was, it was like 2004, maybe. But you couldn't find a copy of it. But there, was, there were a couple of, like, if, you'd have to go to video stores. You know, there was those the years of Blockbuster to rent movies and shit. And so there was this mom and pop video store in the Valley. I can't remember the name of it. But this guy used to record movies that were unavailable off showings, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning and then rent them and he had his hands on a version of a shitty shitty 
friends that he just recorded off of a video cassette vcr player uh, of a showing of nightmare alley and he he rented it to me and i i showed it to guillermo and the rest is history my friend when does that come out i think they're shooting for december of 2021 God willing, and there's no, pan- there's no pandemic by then. Theaters again. Hopefully, we'll all be back in theaters by then. There's two things. There's two personal things I want to ask you about that I always forget to do it because we always get caught up in these caught, caught up in these long conversations or whatever. But I've always had this immense respect, fascination with uh, Charles Durning, and I know that you got to work with him. And did you guys? Did he ever talk about Normandy being on Omaha Beach? And, you know, what he has, you know, like eaten, one, being one of the most decorated soldiers. And then because I, I when I was younger, I remember getting a book of all the actors uh, that were in the military and that, you know, ended up going on. And I remember getting and then there was a chapter on Charles Durning and I was like, Jesus Christ, like not only was he not only did he storm uh, Normandy and was on Omaha Beach, he was in the Battle of the Bulge after that. So. Did you guys ever have a conversation about that, or what was he like? It w- you know. Well, I was aware. This is a, a classic, classic, classic story, and the reason why I say that is because I've seen this not just with Charles, but um, in other instances, and not just military people, but but people in show business and stuff. Um, and I'll get to the point of where, what I'm what I'm referring to in a second, but. I was aware because uh, my friend Dan Loria was best friends with Charles Durning. Dan was a veteran of Vietnam. He was a Marine and stuff. And he was really, uh, you know, had a tremendous sensitivity to the military and to those who serve. And he had downloaded me about Charles Durning's exploits and his, the scope of his heroism. And um, I, I listen to these stories like one does, you know, kind of like, oh my God, really? Like these, these are like epic poems. These, these, the, the things that Charles lived in his life, you know, landing on the beach, Omaha Beach, watching 22 of his comrades fall around him and he ends up being one of the ones that survives. The last survivor, he was the last survivor of his unit. You know, a highly, highly decorated, one of the most highly decorated actors who ever came down the pike. So when I finally met Charles, Charles was like Henny Youngman. I mean, all he wanted to do was tell jokes and, 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 and talk about really cool shit that happened when he was filming this movie and that movie. And, you know, and if you tr- made any attempt to even refer to his life in the military, he would change the subject. He would flat out change the subject. And I say that because I've known a lot of guys in the military from that period, from the World War II guys and the Vietnam guys, who, you know, you're dying to like engage them because you have an, uh, you have an awareness of, of what they've accomplished and what they did and, and, and the kind of manhood that emerged from the situations that had, they had been put in. You want to talk about that. You want to hear them talk about that. And he just wouldn't engage, completely change the subject, tell a joke or, you know, not, not in a, a, a way that was insulting or anything, just change the subject. And toward the end of Charles's life, I think I was on about three movies with him. And the first two were like I just described. And on the third movie, which was probably within months of his death, and I'm probably gonna start crying, We were sitting in our chairs, waiting for them to light a shot. And we had known each other. We had broken bread together 75 times. I had told him every fucking dad joke I ever knew. He told me every dad joke. Yeah, I mean, you know, we had this kind of real beautiful, light and loose couple of journeyman ham character actor relationship. And out of the blue, I'm sitting in a chair and he's sitting next to me and he says, she just would hold me and I would just 
crying her arms all night. And, and then he would say something else about the terrors of the nights he had for 40 fucking some odd years. And now his wife would have to hold on to him while he would just, in order to calm him down, get him to go back to sleep. And all this stuff was something he was living out since those days that he didn't tell anybody. You talk about the greatest generation, you talk about guys who just went through it all with a stiff upper lip, and there was no PTSD. He was a fucking song and dance man who, on the side, was dealing with images and memories that are crippling, unless you're Charles fucking Durning, unless you're some guy with so much grit and so much resolve and so much manhood and you have been brought up and educated in a world where there's no such thing as feeling sorry for yourself you just don't do it you don't ever call attention but just before he died it seemed like he had a need to get it off his chest i didn't ask him i had been i stopped asking him about his situation as a soldier because I know this was all just him getting it off his chest. And it was so, I felt so fucking privileged that he trusted me enough to share this shit with him, with me. But it was remarkable what he had been holding in, the horrors of what he had seen, you know, in terms of watching so many of his comrades fall all around him and have the ability to go on with all that guilt. So that's my Charles Durning story. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers to you, Charles. But I can't let you go. I almost fucking forgot my favorite story of yours is the Marlon Brando story. Mm-hmm. And I want to set it up for you. Um, and so, you know, imagine somebody, because your generation and your point coming up as an actor, that was when Brando was Brando. And the thing that was special about Brando is Brando was Brando without the benefit of Brando. Like he created this thing. He was a genius. He was an artistic, creative genius. And he had this impact and this influence on these actors. And, you know, that we especially you know your generation coming up is like wanted to to imitate him give this homage james dean was a was a marlon brando fanatic you know you see what he does and he's imitating his amateur so you have this icon this legend this thing that had such an impact on you and an inspiration and it, he was a cross between strength and beauty and uh, femininity and masculinity and and all, had all these things and you know, it's a force of nature. Nobody's ever seen anything like this before. And so finally you get this, you get this job on called the Island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> and you get to work with Marlon fucking Brando. And I want to, I want you to walk us through, <laughs> through your expectations and your experience and, <laughs> and when it, how it ended up manifesting itself. Well, you know, I, um, Just, just, just the idea that I would be in the presence of this thing that I had built up in my mind to such a great degree was going to be interesting. I didn't know how it was going to manifest itself or play out, but I knew it was going to be interesting. He was the whole reason why. I would have worked on that movie for free just to be able to say that I'm, I'm in the presence of the fucking guy who is, you know, I can't even, I can't, to this day, I can't describe the degree to why he separates himself from every other actor. I can't describe it. I just know it existed and it didn't exist. In everything he did, he only managed to touch God 
three or four times in his life. His but when he did movies. it, his first uh, five movies are. I would rival that with any five movie run with any actor that's ever existed. And then yeah. from then it, it definitely had, you know, it took other shape. Oh he, yeah. He did some really shitty stuff and he did but some, his first he, five he phoned, movies. He, he phoned it in a lot, you know, and, and he took a lot of jobs for all the wrong reasons and stuff. But, but when he decided to bring it, he got to places that, you know, I'm not the one, the only one who's chronicling it. Everybody knows, you know, everybody, everybody was there when they saw on the waterfront and streetcar named desire. And then the Godfather, you know, it's like, how the fuck did he do that? I'm an actor to this day. I've studied Marlon Brando as much as anybody can study anything. And I still don't know how he did it. I don't know how he was able to get to those places that he got to. All I knew was that, you know, to be in his presence was going to be, it turns out, and this is something that I found out, I don't do well when I'm around <laughs> guys who I have that much reverence for. You know, I don't feel worthy. You know, it, it, like this, this shit comes out that's like, you know, and I become, a, 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 you know, I've used this phrase before, but a, a babbling, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I lose my ability to put words together and I lose my, my mojo. I lose my ma masculinity. I lose, I lose my ability to feel like I'm, you know, worthy of being in a situation like that. And it's something that I dealt with in the book a lot because in meeting Brando, that's what came out. So, um, such a long story. I don't know how you even tell it without. Oh, so you sent him. You sent him these beats. These drummers. These. Uh, <laughs> these yeah. Well, I happen to know that Brando uh, loves Latin music, Latin jazz, to be more specific. And I come from a family of drummers, and Latin jazz was something that I, I, I had a major collection of great Latin jazz. And so when he arrived, I sent to his hotel room my favorite five Latin jazz CDs and no note, you know, just sent it like, this is the, I just want Marlon to, to have this and welcome. Can't wait to work with you. Blah, blah, blah. And so, uh, we finally get to the set to work on this one scene that we have together where, um, he's conducting this trial of one of his experiments that has, cross the line and they before have you decide. get to that scene let me just jump in before you get to that scene you had this brilliant idea because you were playing you know you were playing basically justice and you were like i think i should be blind like blind justice you know and then having the director loved it had the idea so now you're blind you have these things in where you can't see cut to you got this right. you know your big scene with brando who by the way <laughs> <laughs> you guys had like welcoming parties and all this stuff and he didn't show he didn't show up for like the first you know was it three weeks three and, weeks. and you would have like you you said you know you'd have these welcoming parties everything like that so he didn't show up so cut to he's finally showing up you're doing your first scene and now you're playing blind justice yeah well while we're waiting for marlon to show up you know everybody's kind of biding their time and figuring out what we're going to shoot in order to make the studio feel like we're, you know, like we're justifying our existence. Meanwhile, we can't really shoot anything until fucking Marlon gets there. And we don't know. He's, he set it up in a way where we don't know whether he's coming from L.A. Then we hear these rumors he might be coming from Tokyo. Then we hear these rumors where he's coming from Tahiti. So they have PAs at the airport waiting for flights from all these places for three fucking weeks. Oh After God. three fucking weeks, we're having like welcome, welcome to far north Queensland Marlin parties. And he's not there, but we're partying anyway. <laughs> anyway, this one day, the production says, fuck it. They pull all the PAs from all these airport um, little assignments of meeting Marlin's maybe flight. And he arrives from L.A. and there's nobody there to greet him. Um, but in the midst of all this stuff, I'm fucking around with like, how do I want to play this guy? I'm playing this character called Sayer of the Law, which is a, an invention from H.G. Wells from the original 
Um, Bela Lugosi played him in the 1930s version that Charles Lawton starred in called Island of Lost Souls. But Sayer of the Law is a very f- kind of storied character who in- encants these incantations of what the law is for this community of very special laboratory experiments, you know, th- that have come out of the, the, the experiments of, of, of the, the, the weird and strange Dr. Moreau. And it's a sub-society of half man, half animal, so we're all freaks. So we have to, if we don't walk the straight and narrow and, and abide by the laws, we get executed because we become a danger to the community. And I'm the guy who is the sayer of the law. So whenever there's a trial, I say not to walk on all fours, that is the law. Not to slurp, but sip, that is the law. Not, you know, and, and it's like, you know, and the one scene we have is this trial and we do our first shot and Marlon is over there and is on his throne and I'm standing next to him with a staff. And in the midst of, while I was waiting for him, I went to Frankenheim and the director and I said, hey, I got this idea since I'm playing the sayer of the law and since justice is blind and since I'm an experiment that could either go right or wrong in the laboratory, why don't we make him blind? And Frankenheimer said, I need to think about that, Ron. And that's my perfect John Frankenheimer impersonation. He comes up to me two days later. He says, I like it. You're going to be blind. So I go to my makeup boys and I say, look, I not only want to play him blind, I want to have those kind of like the look of a blind man. And they said, well, we can do that for you. We have the lenses, but you're going to be blind because they're opaque. And once we put them in, you can't see your hand in front of your face. I said, oh, that's really fucking cool. I've never done that as an actor before. Wow, you know, wow, how cool would that be? So they put these lenses in and seriously, once they're in, I basically just have to either stand there or sit there because I don't know where I am. I'm completely fucking blind. So when we go around to finally shooting the scene, I'm standing there with a staff and I'm looking straight out and I'm going, we're starting this trial and I'm going, not to walk on all fours, that is the law, not to slurp, but sip, that is the I have this incantation of like 30 laws. And finally, Brando's character is supposed to go, that law has been broken. And we have this trial. And uh, we do this first uh, take, which is this big, long, hard crane shot. And it takes about six hours to get this shot where the crane starts behind my head and goes over me and then goes onto this whole crowd of a thousand extras and then turns and comes back into a shot of the stage and then slowly goes to a two shot of me and Brando and then slowly goes to the mask that's on the top of my staff so you can see my face doing this incantation. That's the shot. Takes six hours to get. We finally finish the shot and Frankenheimer says, uh, okay, Marlon, I want to come in for your close-up now. And uh, Marlon says, my close-up? We haven't shot anything yet. But just, what, why are you coming in for coverage when we, we haven't established the scene yet? He says, no, Marlon, I want to do your close-up right now, and, I, and, 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 and that's, that's my decision. And Marlon says, well, if you're going to come do my close-up, then take those 1,000 extras and put them in the shade and give them a Coca-Cola. And, and, <laughs> and, and, um, and Marlon is wearing these really big sunglasses. And he says, and, and get rid of this guy. And, <laughs> and he, he starts pointing at me. And... and Frankenheimer says, well, I, I prefer to have the extras there, um, you know, and um, if you're talking about Ron Perlman, I feel like he, he's, since he's feeding you all of the dialogue, it's important that he be there too. And Brando says, John, I don't think you're hearing me. It's fucking Australia. There's no ozone layer. It's 140 degrees. Take the extras put them in the shade, give them a Coke. You're going to be shooting my close-up, and I don't need this fucking guy. Get rid of him, too. 
And now he's talking about me. I'm standing right next to him. He's talking about me like I'm dead. Now I've come all this way to be in the presence of Marlon Brando, and he, has, he doesn't want any part of me. He thinks I'm fucking up what he's trying to do. And I'm starting to get nauseous and more and more nauseous and everything like this and going, oh, Jesus, this is not going well. I had one opportunity to have a first impression on Marlon Brando, and all he wants is me gone. And so Brando says, John, um, why are you arguing with me about getting rid of these extras? If the camera's on me and they're back here, why the fuck would you need them? Put them in the shade, buy them a Coke. If you're too cheap to get them a Coke, let me pay for it. Just tell me how much it's going to be and definitely get rid of this fucking guy. <laughs> and so um, Frankenheimer says, there's a special reason why I want the, the extras there. And Brando says, is it because you think you're going to be able to see them in the reflection of my sunglasses? Frankenheimer says, well, that, exactly. That's the exact reason why I want them there, Paul. And he says, well, you're never going to see them, John. He says, well, how do you know I won't see them, Marlon? He says, because I'm going to play the whole fucking scene like this. <laughs> so, all you'll see is the reflection of clouds in the sky. He says, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you your wish. I'm going to send the extras into the shade. We're going to get them a Coca-Cola like you like. You don't have to pay for it. But Ron Perlman stayed. And Brando says, who's Ron Perlman? He says, that's the guy standing next to you playing the sayer of the law. He says, oh, well, what the fuck is he saying? <laughs> and Frankenheimer says, he, he's just saying his dialogue. He says, yeah, but it's stupid. <laughs> and it's distracting me. And I'm having trouble not cracking up. It's ridiculous. You got to get rid of him. And Frankenheimer says, well, it's, and I said, well, maybe, maybe I can step in here, John. I said, first of all, I didn't write this shit. <laughs> this is straight from H.G. Wells from 100 years ago. And Brando goes, well, it's stupid. You know, I, I can't act when you're saying stupid shit like that. It's, 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 it's sending me off my game. And I said, I don't know what to tell you, man. These are lines that have come down from H.G. Wells, and I really wish I didn't have to say them, because I agree with you, Marlon. I think they're stupid, too. He says, well, can you say them so that I can't hear you? <laughs> I go, I could try that. And then they go, okay, that's lunch one hour. So they send me... <laughs> To lunch. Up until this point, what I love so much about this story is you're standing in the presence of your idol and, and you're blind and you're standing and he's like, get rid, of, get rid of this guy. Yeah, and he's so um I go to lunch and I I start projectile vomiting because the whole reason I'm there, the whole my whole life, I've been dreaming about what, what's gonna, what is it going to be like when I meet Marlon Brando, and he thinks I'm this fucking piece of shit actor who you know, can't say a line of dialogue and wants me to speak so softly he can't hear me. In fact, he'd rather have me in my trailer you know, and play the scene without me. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. And it's like a one-hour lunch, and by about 10 minutes before we're about to go back to work, I have, I have um, thrown up three or four times and wanted to kill myself and then finally said to myself, you know what? Fuck Marlon Brando. <laughs> they hired me to play this guy and I don't give a shit whether he likes me or not. I got to play him. And so we come back after lunch and I decide I'm not going to let anything throw me. I don't give a shit whether Marlon Brando likes it or not. And we start playing the scene, and it starts to go really, really good, right? And I could feel Brando like, hmm, we're actually something, something good is going on here. And then I start to go, holy fuck, we got a thing going on here. We were building this thing together, and we're, you know, and I'm acting with Marlon Brando, and all of a sudden I hear him go, 
it's your line. And I don't know who he's talking to. He goes, hey, you, it's your line. And I'm looking around and going, who the fuck is he talking to? He goes, hey, asshole. <laughs> I can realize he's like, it's your line. And, you know, he's got the, he's got the, 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 the earpiece. So he knows when I'm, it's my line and when it's his line. Because, you know. Anyway, we do this for five days. And um, because I'm blind and because I, I get very nauseous when they put the lenses in, they take them out and they put them back in. So I decide I'm just going to keep the lenses in as long as I can. And I'm going to sit there in one spot waiting for them between shots to light the shot and everything like this. On the fifth day, I'm sitting in the middle of this tiny little platform where his, his chair is. And I have a little rock where I can sit or stand. And they call Brando back to the set to get ready to shoot something. And I feel these two hands grab my shoulders really fucking violently. And I go, ah, like this, right? And I hear him whisper in my ear, because I can't see him. I, he says, what is that in your eyes? <laughs> I go, Marlon? He goes, wait a minute. Are you, are those lenses? I go, yeah. He goes, wait a minute. Are you, are you playing him blind? I go, yeah. Five days later. He goes, John, you didn't tell me he was playing him blind. We got to start again. <laughs> <laughs> Five days. He did not notice that I was like, he had no idea why he had to keep walking around me, why I never knew how to get out of his way, why I never knew whether he was there or not there. You were an idiot. He just thought I was this big fucking lug idiot <laughs> who couldn't say dialogue. Here's the, here's the final punchline. He says to me, you're playing the sayer of the law blind. He said, I got to tell you something. That's fucking good. He said, by the way, I just heard something else. Are you the guy that sent me all that Latin jazz when I got here? I go, yeah. And I was wondering whether you got it because I never heard that you received it or I never, you know, I don't give a shit whether you thank me or not, but I know you like this shit. He goes, like it? I've been dancing my ass off in my trailer. How come you're not in there fucking hanging out with me? And wow. that was, wow. that was, that's my Marlin story. Wow. I said, you know, I said, I didn't know. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, take liberties and show up and, you know, but I'm really glad you like the music and stuff. So you turned the corner with him, man. That was cool. That's a great, that's a great way to end it. That's a great story. This was a great, this was a fun podcast. I love you, brother, man. We'll be respectful of your time and, uh, and let you go. I got you, bro. Yeah, all right, man. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Take it easy, um, fellas. Right, Thank buddy. you for asking. Yeah, buddy. We'll talk soon. Thank you for that special tie in that guy. That was a great time uh, talking to one of my favorite people, Ron Perlman. And uh, I had a good time. Did you have a good time, Ty? Yeah, I mostly stayed quiet in this one because uh, you guys have so much history. It was I, I was having so much fun just listening to the conversation. I, I didn't want to butt in most of the time. I didn't notice. I thought you asked some great questions. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I... I had more fun listening than I did talking on this one. Um, I definitely had, I definitely knew the stories that I wanted to get to. And I knew that we only had a certain amount of time. So I was being aggressive about getting to all those stories. Uh, and, and I'm glad you did. Cause uh, some of those stories are amazing. His, his Brando story. That's the highlight, man. What a great story, man. That story. And you get, you know, there's, there's all kinds of details and variations that, you know, that uh, the, when you hear that story over and over and over and I just, just the fact of like finally getting to meet your 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 icon, your your legend, and hit the first words he said to you is get rid of this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then after five days of working with him, he goes, "Wait a minute, you're blind." <laughs> <laughs> this brilliant choice that he had. So, um, but thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for hanging out with Ron. Uh, please let us know, uh, what you think and, uh, like, and subscribe and, uh, 
Excellent. Thank you, guys.